Okay. Welcome to the Board of Library Trustees meeting, Monday, October 21st, 2024. I now call this meeting to order at 7.04. Recently, regional and local elected and appointed bodies have been subjected to disruptive, racist, verbal attacks by anonymous callers during virtual public meetings. Public comments. The City of Mountain View is fully committed to racial, religious, and cultural equity and justice as we strive to create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive community for all. This advisory board commission welcomes respectful and non-threatening public comments regarding matters over which the advisory body commission has jurisdiction. Comments deemed otherwise, pursuant to the Council Code of Conduct and the Government Code, may be grounds for immediately terminating the speaker's comment period. All votes will be taken by roll call vote. Now I will ask the library director, director to proceed with roll call. Um, Chair Eric Nerwick is absent. Um, Kristen, Vice Chair Kristen Higaki, present. Board member Toby Grimbasta, present. Board member Sharon Sue, present. Board member Nicole Bo. Um, minutes approval. So minutes for the September 16th, 2024 meeting have been delivered to board director, uh, board members. If there are no corrections or additions, a motion is in order to approve these minutes. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on an item on the minutes approval? If so, click the raise hand button in Zoom or press pound nine on your phone. The library director will display the timer on the screen. Second. Uh, Vice Chair Kristen Higaki. Yes. <laughs> Board member Colin Basta. Yes, approved. Member Sharon Sue. Yes. Board member Nicole Bo. I approve. Communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the board on any matter not on the agenda. Speakers are allowed to speak on any topic for up to three minutes during the session. If there appears to be a large number of speakers, speaking time may be reduced to no less than 1.5 minutes. State law prohibits the board from acting on non-agenda items. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on non-agenda items? If so, please click the raise hand button on Zoom or press file 9 on your Library director will display the timer on the screen. On to donations. So I have a recommendation to accept the library donations. Daniel Pappas of $1,000 and the Gannon family of $1,455.30. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press pound nine on your phone. The library director will display the timer on the screen. Good. Okay. Share our gratitude to the Gannon family for their generosity to the library. Yes. And I did bring you right, two items so to pass around. So the first, and I love that he wrote it on paper, like yeah. notebook paper. Um, I love it. Um I'll read it. This is from Daniel Pappas. I spend several hours each week using your library to keep up to date on my fields of interest and current events. Your staff is always knowledgeable, polite, and cheerful. Thank you, Dan Pappas. So um, the thousand dollars will be used for um, uh, programs, supplies, um, furniture, things that are needed um, in uh, the library. And I'll pass that around. And for the Gannon family, um, the Gannon family had approached us because they're, um, they wanted something um, in memory and also, and, and, and we worked with them 
Um, we love the library. It's in loving memory of our incredible mother, Connie Gannon, and wonderful sister, Sally Gannon, Leach. Leach. Thank you for pronouncing it. Forever in our hearts, we love you, the Gannon family. And they approached us. They um, approached us. They wanted um, something um, physical for the library. They originally asked outside a park bench because the park is is the community services department. But we said, you know, here's some options. Joy work with them. And so um, they 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 talked about furniture, something for the library. And so they funded. That's why the amount. Has has the it's a very unique amount. So they purchased um, table and chairs for one of our tables that's right um, by the park door entrance. So that when people use it, they and they see outside the library the lovely park. Um, and so I'll pass around. We're going to um, after tonight since it's officially been accepted. Um, we'll have facilities put the the. Um, memorial on the table and then I took a picture of what it'll look like it hasn't been installed yet but it'll be on the on the table in the um one of them right outside the parking entrance kind of near the teen area so that was what you were going to do cheers <laughs> makes sense yeah <laughs> I think we still need to conduct the consent to generous donation. Second. Vice Chair Kristen Nagafi. Yes. Um, board Member Cliffy Bambasta. Yes. Board Member Sharon Sue. Yes. Board Member Nicole Cook. Yes. Okay, next, we're on to presentations. Uh, friends of the Library. Hi, this is Marika. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, this is my first time attending one of these meetings. <laughs> so apologies if I'm uh, if I uh, don't exactly follow uh, what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, please, please correct me if, if necessary. Um, I, I think you just you wanted to hear an update from from the friends. I, I believe this is an annual um, annual event here. Is that right? Those breaths. Okay. All right. Um, would it help if I told you a little bit about myself first, or do you want to just get right into the friends? Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so my name is Marika Sakura. Um, I have lived in Mountain View for uh, 18 years now um, and uh, have uh, always been an uh, avid um, library goer. <laughs> I love the Mountain View Library, and I'm always telling Tracy how lucky we are to have such a wonderful library in our city. Um, I became a volunteer with the Friends actually during the pandemic <clears throat> because it was one of the, um, really one of the only places where they were taking volunteers, um, you know, sort of right when people came out of, you know, th that very first shutdown. And I've always been a big volunteer. Um, I've um, been volunteering with with lots of different nonprofits over the years. Um, and um, especially close to my heart is the Junior League of San Jose, where I was on the board for many years, and I was the president um, for a year there as well. Um, and so I yeah, I started volunteering just in the lobby shop. And I was I started talking to Sarah Donahue, who was the president at the time. And that and I had some ideas about different things that we could do with the friends. And she invited me to attend board meetings. And then um, I became a board member. And then uh, just in June, I was voted in as board president. So I'm newer to the Friends, um, about, I guess, three or four years now, um, but longtime volunteer. And, and I've been on, on boards of nonprofits for a long time. Um, 
so that's a little bit about about me and my history. Um, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be Q&A or if I should just keep going. <laughs> so you can stop me whenever you want. Um, and an update for you for the friends. So one of the things um, that I did as vice president of the of the friends board last year was um, I put together a project um, to create and to sort of re-envision where we were going as an organization, especially coming out of the pandemic. And so we um, updated our mission, which didn't change um, very much from the original mission, but we put together um, a strategic plan, which is, you know, sort of our three to five year goals. And then we also put together an annual plan. Um, and I thought I would just review the strategic plan with you. Um, so we have three, um, three main areas for our strategic, for our strategic plan. One of them is to ensure the long-term viability of the organization by creating a diverse volunteer pipeline, including board members. Um, this one is really important to us because one of the things that we found during the pandemic was that we really couldn't do anything without volunteers. And, and we needed to ensure, and we, and we do need to ensure that we can always have enough volunteers, not only to just run the day-to-day -day events, but we need people that are interested in spending, um, you know, probably more than just one or two hours a week and really um, giving their brain power to the organization behind the friends. And that's a different type of volunteer. And all volunteering is important and valuable, um, but it's not the person that shows up um, a couple hours a week to um, you know, man the lobby shop. It's somebody who um, you know, has, has different talents, wants to get really into the weeds kind of operationally and managerially, and is willing to make a long-term commitment to the friends. And what we saw coming out of the pandemic was that um, it was really hard to find those types of people again. And we, we really have to re-engage with the community to find volunteers that are really willing to make a commitment to the organization. And we felt that that was so important that it's the first part of our strategic plan. And uh, if I could interject briefly, when you talk about consistent volunteers, is it five hours a week, 10, kind of what's your benchmark? Um, it, it really depends. So uh, in the in the lobby shop, we ask for two hours a week. Um, if we're doing online sales, again, it's sort of weekly commitments, um, probably two to three hours a week. We also have quarterly book sales. So that might be, you know, a three hour shift four times a year. Um, but if you're a board member, you know, we have... The monthly board meeting, you're expected to go to other events. Typically, you also have another kind of managerial role on the board. And so it's probably a good five to 10 hours a month, um, which, you know, for a lot of people isn't really that much. If you think about, you know, if you've been, you know, volunteering at your kid's school or or anything like that, um, but it's um, it is difficult to just find the right person as I'm sure you guys are all aware in, in the different organizations that you work with. Uh, the second part of our strategic plan is to cultivate an environment where all volunteers feel appreciated and valued. And again, this is volunteer centric. And rather than being about the, you know, kind of higher level um, volunteers, it's really just how do we make sure that volunteers want to come back to us, right? Because, um, you know, it takes some time to train volunteers. We really don't want them just kind of coming in for a month and coming out. Um, and we want people who want to grow with us, right? Uh, like, you know, my example, I started in the lobby shop and it was just because I was interested that, you know, then I became, you know, a board member and I was managing book sales for a few years. Um, and so we want people to be able to, to grow and expand and really find 
value in the work that they do with the friends. And the final part of our strategic plan is to create a repeatable and adaptable fundraising model, ensuring a minimum annual gift of $100,000 to the library. So I believe prior to the pandemic, we were giving a little bit more than $100,000. Um, we, I think, and Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're giving about 95,000 this year. Yeah. Um, and we are able to do that because we received um, a very significant donation of about $120,000 from the Mountain View Women's Association that essentially closed um, about a year ago. Um, we are running at a deficit. So without that donation from the Women's Association, we would not be able to give the library $100,000 this year. We're about, we would be, we would be about 25,000 short. So that was the other reason why it was really important for us to put a strategic plan together, because as a board, we really want to be able to give $100,000 every year or more. Um, how do we, how do we ensure that that happens? And so we needed to have a plan in place to do that because that women's fund money will run out in a few years. <laughs> and so we need to be able to um, fill that fill that gap. Um, what I have seen um, in the community is that without the volunteers and without a really strong um, management foundation, the organization will not last. And so that's why we're really focused on volunteers because with, with the volunteers, the money will come. Um, and so that's why we have two, um, you know, uh, two thirds of our strategic plan really around volunteers. Any questions or comments that I can take back to the board? Are you only having difficulty finding volunteers for your strategic um, visionary kind of efforts or is it regular staffing as well like during your your quarterly sales and books so for the quarterly book sales we typically do fine but that is largely due to um i would say about 30 percent of our volunteers from the book sales have been doing it for, I don't know, five to 10 years. Um, we do get a lot of um, high schoolers coming for, for the book sales because they need volunteer hours for their, either for their college applications or for their high school requirements. Um, but when they're in school, it's difficult for them to do other volunteer roles, right? Because they're typically during the day. Um, so where we have a hard time is what I would call sort of like mid-level managers and board members. That's where we have a really hard time finding volunteers because it's that extra level of commitment that we need from people. Um, like I said earlier, it's not just showing up for two hours, four times a year. It's, you know, really giving your time and effort outside of, you know, coming to a meeting or, um, you know, showing up at an event. It's, um, you know, thinking about, you know, how, how are we going to execute the strategic plan, right? Um, it, and not all of that just happens, um, you know, it, in a room. And um, I may interject again, in terms of the potential deficit that you mentioned that was avoided, thankfully, is there any uh, thought being put into maybe running a very focused capital campaign of some sort? Yes, we are working on that. Um, we're, in fact, looking at restructuring our membership model, um, which, you know, isn't just a capital campaign. But, um, you know, we have done some very initial um, research that our membership model um, is probably too inexpensive for people and doesn't really um, um, kind of create the um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? It, it doesn't show the value of what the friends does for the community. Um, so we're, we're looking at, um, you know, just a fundraising campaign. We're also looking at changing our membership model, which is essentially an annual giving campaign. And we're also looking at for the, for the quarterly book sales, um, increasing our, um, our pricing. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Can you share more on, um, or have you identified why there was a deficit? Like what, what dropped from prior years? Yes. Um, it is mostly the quarterly book sales. Um, and so our lobby shop sales have been fairly consistent. Our online sales have actually grown um, over the past few years, even prior to the pandemic. Um, but our quarterly book sales are down. Um, and so we're still trying to understand if that is a function of the number of donations that we're getting, which we then, you know, turn around and sell, or if it's just that we're getting too few people coming to the book sales themselves. You know, I, I think for probably 10 or 15 years, right, we've, we've heard, you know, oh, people don't read books anymore. Um, you know, everybody uses, you know, Kindle or iPad or whatever, yet you go to the library and it's full of books and full of people. <laughs> and, um, and we still get people coming to book sales. Um, so uh, it's, um, well, to answer your question, the, the decrease is coming from the quarterly book sales. But as I mentioned, we're not sure if that's a function of just a decrease in the number of books or a decrease in the number of people coming to the sales. Are you perhaps, this is Nicole, are you perhaps concerned that this is tied to a shift of the population who used to come more frequently to the book sales shifting towards electronic reading? Well, that's one of the things we're thinking, you know, that, that people are shifting their reading habits. Um, however, because the change was largely, or because the change was uh, was largely seen right after the pandemic, I'm not sure that it's really the move to electronic. Um, so I, I, we can't say that for certain. Do you know whether or not other library, friends of libraries have a similar trend? We do. So we do um, have a very kind of informal um, organization of um, nearby friends, and they are all um, struggling, especially since the pandemic. Uh, although struggling is is a tough is is probably too strong a word. I mean, they're all raising money, they're all doing great things for their libraries, but they are all seeing a downward trend. Um, I feel like this was a little depressing and it was not meant to be. <laughs> I would like to reiterate that we are always looking at um, new ways or, you know, improving what we're currently doing because um, as a board, I mean, we're, we're so invested in our library, um, honestly, every one of us, um, uh, you know, even just... Um, you know, a very recent thing that we did was, um, if you guys are familiar with the lobby shop downstairs, you know, we sell, you know, what we call gift items, not just books. Um, and at the last book sale, we created a pop-up shop um, where we brought the gift items and, you know, t-shirts and tote bags out to this, you know, cute little area. It was decorated like a store. Um, and, you know, we made pretty good money out there. Um, so we're going to be doing that again uh, for the November book sale. And we're also for that sale, we're specifically targeting, you know, holiday type items um, in, in the sort of gift areas. And we're also going to bring in things like um, book sets, right? So things that you could buy as gifts 
for, you know, maybe grandkids or friends or something like that, priced a little bit higher than the book sale books. Um, but, you know, sort of curated for customers so that it's really easy to, you know, spend $15 on a book sale and or on a book set. And now you've, you know, crossed off um, a gift recipient from your list. So that's another sort of stream of revenue that we're that we're looking at. And and we're hoping that that can be pretty successful for November, you know, as we head into the holidays. Very exciting, thank you. You're welcome. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for what you do for the library. And um, my main interactions with friends are through the lobby shop and the quarterly sales. And everyone mm -hmm. is always so joyful and cheerful and really great energy. So it makes, it's an extension of how um, warm and inclusive the library is. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think we'll move on to the further step presentation on policy administration. Thanks, Marika. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we have Renee, our senior librarian, Renee Team. She was here, I think it was in May, talking about library programs in the bookmobile, and she talked about um, one of the tools the state library provides to libraries on data mapping. And so some of the questions that you all had for her, I know Nick Wool was very interested. So we wanted to be sure to have um, before, <laughs> before that, uh, Nick Wool's last meeting to make sure um, she was here for the presentation on the tool that Renee was using on, um, on how we selected some of our book bill stops and um, the vast data that that we have at the librarians have access to. So thanks so much for coming again, Renee. <laughs> no problem. Um, so this is going to be a really quick whirlwind um, look at something called policy map. Um, I don't I don't know a lot about about policy map. Um, as a whole, but what I do know is that it was made available to us as uh, part of the California State Library. So anybody who uh, works for a library in California could uh, just get an account, and once you get an account, you can log on and access this um, amazing tool. Um, so basically, it's a it's a data tool. It's a geo uh, geo data tool, so you can um, see um, a, a lot of different data mapped in um, mapped on map. Um, I'll, I'll show you a, a very simple, very simple example of, uh, let's call it household, median household income. And um, here's a map of a median household income in the, looks like, you know, the, the Peninsula South Bay area. And, um, and I'm just going to, I've already selected Mountain View here. And what I can do is I can click Mountain View out. And so we're only looking at Mountain View. And when we only look at Mountain View, we can see that there's um, five different colors, basically. And so what it does is it separates out the, um, based on a, 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 group of, a, a group of blocks, basically, it's called block groups of the medium income and then separates them out into quintiles. And the darkest color is the highest quintile. So that's the top 20% of um, household income while the lightest purple is the lowest 20%. Um, what's interesting about this, I just wanna, I'm gonna click this US data for just a second. And when you look at Mountain View, income versus the entire US, we see like pretty much all the Mountain Views in the top 20%. So um, it's really more useful for us to choose map extent so we can choose where we're mapping and look, and then it'll break down whatever you're looking at into quintiles 
only within the area that you've selected. So we've selected Mountain View, and we can look at Quintel, uh, we can look at Inca. Um, as you can see across the top, we have all sorts of information that we can look at. We can, um, but there's point data like schools and parks, and we'll just it'll just put the points on your map for you. And then there's um, distributed data where it does this with the quintiles. So we can have all sorts of demographic information, um, just total number of people. We can do it by race. We can do it by age, sex, um, migration. who are immigrants, who are not immigrants, the language that they're speaking. So as like you can imagine, this kind of information is super useful for for looking at who's in our community and um, you know who can we reach in our community. Um, incomes and spending, it's like, it's broken down very granularly. Um, we can look at like percentage of people who are food insecure. We can look at all sorts of housing stuff, you know, housing prices, housing sales, rental units. Funding. I don't usually look at this, but like banking and mortgage numbers, quality of life, um, we look at transportation, internet access. Um, you can look at food deserts. You can um, you can look at uh, park, park locations that'll just point out all the different parts. And Renee, uh, yeah. on one of the tabs, I think under income and spending, there was a Gini coefficient. Can we look at that? Income inequality, yeah, fourth down. That is Gini uh, coefficient. It's a measure of inequality. Uh, as to you know, so if you're well off, it'll read differently than if you're not well off, so to speak. So yeah, I was just curious to see that. And then my other question was on the first screen that you had. I think it mapped out income data, mm -hmm. and Mountain View was pretty well reported, but there were still some areas where it, it said like insufficient data. It did yeah and. I guess I'm a bit surprised by that because, you know, typically with the U.S. Census plus other data sources, you can pretty much analyze anywhere pretty well. So why would there be um, certain pockets where there's no data or not enough data? It could be because I chose household income. Let's choose per capita income. Okay. And also... Um, let me put that out again. And also... Um, Depending, you can choose your source in some cases. So in this case, this the source is the census right here. Um, we're looking at the data by census tract, which is a little bigger than um, block group. But there's this like. Yeah, there's a blank area in here. Oh, that's a good part. So we're pretty well, there's nothing north of 101, and I'm not sure if it's because people don't live there. <laughs> right, like There's if it's a government any... facility yeah. or something, or, yeah. or if it's park, then yes, of course. Yeah. Wouldn't have any data, right? Well, I think depending on what you're going to choose, like what the source is, what your map, um, what your... Uh, you can choose the the level or the, these are all actually uh, different sized areas. And so for different data, they may not have block group data. They only have zip code data or something like that. So for, for census data, it gets as small as block group. And it looks like this is probably going to be the most data you're, you're going to get, which looks pretty full for Mountain View. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense now. Thanks, Ken. Um, we can look at. We can look at. How do we use it? Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna yeah. So we, I mean, you can run through all the tabs, and you can say, "Oh, wow, that's a lot of data." All right. How do we use it? So um, I mean, I use it. I I have used it for looking at Bookmobile routes and Bookmobile stops. And so what I do is, okay, let's say um, I'm I I was mostly looking at parks. And looking at should we go to this park? What's around this park? Um, so, for example, let's say um, the the city is opening a new park soon, and it's called Villa Chiquita. This is a 
real park that they're opening soon. It's the corner of Villa Street and Chiquita Street. And so I can I can go and I can go in and look, find this street. Here's Chiquita. Here's the one. Okay. So this looks like it's in the it's right in the middle of this um, block group. So that's great. So I can look at all the data for this block group. Now I want to see, um, first of all, I, I do want to see what the income of this area is. And um, so I'm looking at, this is per capita income and we're in the second quintile. Um, so the per capita income of this area is 83,000. Um, the median income of Santa Clara County is 120. So we know we're well below median. Um, so that that's a like right off the bat, that's a good candidate for Google going there just just for that alone. But let's say I want to know, um, I, I would like to know the population density because if the area is sparsely populated, it's more difficult for people to walk to the bookmobile. If it's a it's got a lot of apartment buildings, it's going to be easier. Um, so that's actually demographics. And that's population density. And so I can see that this area is pretty densely populated. Number of people per square mile is 13,702. So this is in the second to highest quintile of population density, just compared to Mountain View, because I've selected Mountain View as my border. Just select, just compared to, to Mountain View. Or actually, actually does what's on my screen. So in order to see, I, I actually have to zoom out to see most of Mountain View because it's comparing to everything on my screen. Um, but yeah, we're in the second, so not bad. Um, so I wanna know, let's see, are there a lot of children? Like, um, I wanna know if they're families with children. H. families, households. Households of children? I, <laughs> it's, I can choose. Um, now let's just go with family type. Yeah. Percentage of families with children. This was us. It's actually pretty low. So this area doesn't have um, a high percentage of families with children, in the lowest quintile. So then I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't a children's stop. Maybe this is more of a adult senior stop, which in which case I don't have to go after school. I can go during school. Um, so we can, I mean, we can look at, are there um, people 65 and older in this area? So let's say 65 and older. No, not a lot of people 65 and older. So I'm like, huh, all right. I'm not sure who we would reach in this area um, and when the best time would be to go. So these are all considerations. Um, other things that I've looked at are, um, you know, households with no vehicles. What's the percentage? If it's a pretty high percentage, then I know that they're, they're gonna have difficulty getting to the library. Um, it might be better to go there. Um, I look at, uh, look at the poverty level, of course, not just the income, but like the percentage of households below the poverty level. Um, and I also looked at, um, households that have multiple job holders or households that where people have multiple jobs. You can even, you can see all this in here. Um, so if, if people have multiple jobs, Probably not, they probably don't have a lot of time to get to the library. Maybe if there's like high number of children and also high number of jobs, the bookmobile could go to this area and the children may be able to use the bookmobile without parents having to drive them to the library. So there's so many different considerations and things that we can look at 
And you can also like, you know, then like kind of chart out, okay, we're looking at these six different parts to consider. So um, which one is the best in this? Which one is the best in that? And where can we, so the big question, the big question that we're trying to ask is where can we make the biggest impact and how can we make the biggest impact? Um, where should we go and when should we go and who are we going to see when we get there? We're trying to kind of estimate that before we get there so we can choose where to go with our with our limited amount of time and resources to make the biggest impact. That is like a really quick overview of this and how we used it in one really small area of choosing what we build stops. And Renee has it has well, well, first of all, I think this is great. It'll be very helpful. Um, has it changed in any way your bookmobile strategy yet, or is it too soon to say? Um, um, you mean from before we started using it or since we started using it? <laughs> so, I guess a bit of both. Yeah, before we started using it, we were guessing. Mm -hmm. We we're really guessing. Sure. Um, so we were thinking, um, you know, we we have these ideas in our head. We want to reach low income neighborhoods. We want to reach families with children, but we don't really know where they are. Um, so we're 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 literally just guessing. Um, so now that we have it, and so we've like pinpointed a few parts. We've been going for um, nine months. Um, so now we have to look at like, okay, what is the data that we're collecting at the parks? Do people come? Do children come? Are families and children coming? Are seniors coming? How is that comparing to what we were expecting? Um, and it's it's not too early to tell, but it's a little bit like, it's not like huge crowds are coming. So, so it's hard to say whether it's because we chose poorly or because huge crowds are never going to come to a park stop. And you have to, I mean, I guess it's too early to say. We're nine months in. We're going to try a couple different spots. We're going to, um, we're going to see if things build over time. Or maybe this is just how it is. Maybe you're reaching the people you can reach and, you know, and if we went to a different spot, it would be worse, right? Um, it's, it's a lot of trial and error based on like the best data that we have sure. with the best knowledge that we can get at the time. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Question? yeah. What type of promotion do you do when you pick a new bookmobile location? We started with like lawn signs in the park. Um, and, but we, again, we didn't know whether the long signs were working or whether it's just the, the visual and word of mouth. Um, the long signs didn't make it to the rainy season. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At least we had a rainy season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but during that time, we were seeing an increased in, in, increasing numbers coming. Um, it's kind of leveled off. So so we were thinking that even if the lawn signs had made a difference in the beginning, they probably have stopped making the difference. We're, we've sort of leveled off. Um, we we advertise the stops on our website. You know, the Book of Beale has a schedule that's published on our website. We advertise our park stops, at least in the library, in the children's room, because we do do a mini story time at each park. Um, and that seems to be pretty popular. So um it's all the all the sort of same normal channels as our regular programming with that extra lawn sign for a little while. I know that this is maybe a basic observation, but there are some places that do laminated lawn signs. Mm -hmm. It'll be slightly more expensive, of course, but... Well, uh, because lawn sign is made of plastic. It's not the lawn sign itself that didn't make it. We wanted to, because we don't come to each park every week, the scheduling is 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 how to... How to um, how to let people know what the schedule is. We had a, we had, we were changing out this piece of paper inside a holder to, to tell when the next time we're going to be here is. Okay. It, it, <laughs> yeah. 
So. I think we were trying to do too much with the one side. <laughs> Got it. You've mentioned previously that, that you have a, just like the Grateful Dead, you have groupies. <laughs> so you have people that are, are following you around to all the sites. Are you able to remove their contribution to the population counts? Um, no, and, but I don't think it's a huge number of people who are doing that. It's probably be like a couple families. Um, um, so maybe at most um, it did. Yeah, sense. a lot of that is just anecdotal too, right? So, so we just sort of know that a few people at each stop or maybe don't live there. That's that's kind of like anecdotally what we know. You asked, I know this This is unfortunately going to have the bias of only sampling the people who are coming to the mm. Cocovia, but have you asked them what are the locations in their community they think would draw people? Like, has anyone suggested going no, to the No, I mean, I, I do plan to do a survey, mm. and I was just starting to think about what kind of questions to ask on that survey, so that would be, <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a great point, and even to widen the scope, so to speak, you could even, I know the city of Mountain View sometimes does a newsletter that they send through postal mail, so you can maybe have like a short blurb, you know, if anybody's interested in giving feedback, just contact us on this topic. particularly for the areas where car ownership is low, I wonder whether some very unorthodox channels might might be useful, things that wouldn't necessarily come up because they're not representative of a more typical library user. Like, would laundromats be a good place to go for an area where a lot of people don't have a washer and dryer? At yeah, time? absolutely. I know. I mean, if you're waiting for your clothes to dry anyway, maybe you. Yeah, that is that is a model that um, libraries have taken, which is to set up a little library inside the laundromat, or 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 do a story time, mm -hmm. you know, laundromat. Yes, that's definitely a model. We have we have definitely talked about it. <laughs> well, advertising on public transport would also. Think that bucket, perhaps. Yeah, we don't we don't spend money on advertising here at the library. Um, it's mostly just PR and uh, marketing. This might be a silly question, but are there story times at the senior center that you? Oh. Um. Yeah, the, the old proposal used to do a story time at the senior center because there's a preschool right next to it. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing the pre we're not we're not visiting preschools right now. Um, and we're taking that sort of preschool um literacy component into the park. If I ran along to that, I would love to hear a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At any population, I would be happy to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Instead of flipping through a magazine or something, it would be useful to do that. Question At the elementary schools, mm -hmm. um, I know it's usually scheduled to be constantly when the older grades get out. Mm -hmm. Is it assumed that any children checking out books are checking it out on? library cards since that they don't qualify for as a connect um no no, oh. no um children can get library cards um and a lot of the children do have their own library cards but we'll we'll check it out on theirs or their guardians it doesn't matter as long as they have a card um the, the only reason that we only go to when the older kids get out is because um we can't Staffing wise, we couldn't be there for the entire time. It's like it would have to be a two and a half hour window where you the, the kinders get out and then you wait and then the older kids get out. So we had to choose one or the other and just sheer numbers. There's more first through fifth graders than there are kinders. So we had to choose one and, and I feel terrible. <laughs> but on Thursdays, on the early release days, they get let out at the same time. And so the Thursday schools are extra lucky. So it sounds like I can like, recommend to other families that their children can be signing up at the Bumblebee for a card. Oh, they can't sign up on their own. Right. They can get a card with their parents, permission with their parent, but then um, once they have the card, they can use it on their own. Okay. So they need their parent to get the card. 
And this may sound like an obscure question. I do understand numbers wise what you said about kindergartners versus I think grades one through five. And that makes sense. But have you looked at the success rate, so to speak? Like, okay, maybe the kindergartners are a smaller population, but you can issue more library cards through them percentage wise versus grades one through five. We haven't looked at that. But I think if you're talking about impact, it's really impossible to say what the impact you're making on a kindergartner, like giving a kindergartner a book versus giving, you know, a first grader a book. Um, you, I have to approach it like, like it's all equal. Like if I give a kindergartner a book, the impact to that one person is the same as giving a first grader a book. And there's just so many more first graders. <laughs> there's just five times more. So right. I, yeah, okay. I have to assume that the impact is the same. Um, um, and and then I I I sort of do assume that the the chances of getting a library card is also the same. Um, I feel like if the parents value the library and feel like it's important, then they'll they'll do it, regardless of. Well, not regardless, but they'll do it. Um, okay. Yeah. The existing sites on the bookmobile path, how well do you feel that you're explaining the numbers you see with usage based on the data from the two states? Um, I can't yet because I think I would have to, I would have to have a different set to compare. Um, or, or just compare to each other. Mm, yeah, like if you, if you hide your data from yourself for half the sites mm -hmm. and then based on what you do see the, the yeah. correlation between the tool and yeah, your data yeah, for your yeah. other sites how yeah. well are you reproducing um, good predictive power i think i feel like the numbers are too small to to show like huge predictive power we're getting like say between 50 15 to 30 people at each stop yeah um but the, I can say that the one park that's in a less densely populated area that has a slightly higher income than the other ones is getting less people, but it's still less is like, you know, 10 people less. So it feels right, but <laughs> it doesn't seem like robust data. <laughs> Do you think it might be possible to bin the existing data in the library system on library cards? Just the number yeah, we've been um, we've been thinking about that. Yeah, like looking at the power of this and the power we can um, upload our data, map it as well. So, so something that we have thought about. <laughs> and here's another obscure idea, but sometimes children especially respond well to incentives. Free lollipop for the first hundred children who <laughs> <laughs> is that something that you've tried or <laughs> we may do more um crafty kind of things and steam kind of things or we're we're in you know, we're starting to ramp up things in that way. I think we're really impressed by the number of cards we issued or that were issued at the Lunar New Year. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, celebration. Yeah, but I wonder is that more when the city and or whoever's coordinating invites the bookmobile, or is there any tie into the map that you just showed us? No, we're invited by the city to participate in the city event. You mentioned that you don't go like every week, right, to to certain places. And is there? I don't know if it's kind of cyclical, right? Like maybe you don't go often to that place because not a lot of people go. But then maybe not a lot of people go because yes. it's not at you know the regular cadence that's in. Because for me, the mental model would be, oh, they're here every Thursday, right? But then if it's all of a sudden not there, then I'm like, oh, maybe I don't know if it's going to be there. 
in an ideal world, yes, we would be able to go every Thursday. But um, given that there's only four days a week of service, yeah. and um, the Coco Book can only go just for staffing, just because of staffing, we can only go to two stops a day. Um, if I want to go to four different parks, mm -hmm. there's just not enough time in a week to go to four different parks every week. So we had to rotate it. Yeah, so um, I, I know that other bookmobiles around the country, I um, I attend the Association of Bookmobiles <laughs> Conference. <laughs> um, they, everyone's struggling with this, like, is two, is every other week enough? Is every three weeks enough? So like, you know, and the, the sweet spot, like, is, is I feel like, okay, you don't have to go every week to get that momentum, but like two to three is really great. Four is acceptable, but like no one's going more than four, like, you know, more than five weeks in between. Um, and so that's where we're trying to, to fit this in. And so we were trying to do this like two week rotation for the, for the um, parts. We had to cut it to four because, um, we were doing three stops a day and it was getting really hard on the staff. So, um, so yeah, there is that sweet spot. It's probably around two weeks to every two weeks. Yeah. Um, and so for most of our staff, we try to do that. Um, and then just for scheduling purposes, if we're unable to then, then spread it out. You get a sense that most of the books that are being checked out via the bookmobile are also being returned via bookmobile stops? Um, most, but not all. We do get a lot of returns at the library. Um, there's a there's a special cart on the library for bookmobile returns because they have to be wheeled down the hall. And um, you can see every day, it's like this many books. So, the, so there's a, a non-trivial population that's using the bookmobile and has made it as far as the library in person as well. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might see that spiking in the hall with children in schools. It's definitely the children in the schools. Mm -hmm. And then we, we have a lot of regulars that we see in the library, um, and then we see them at the school, and they're happy to see us, and they love us, but it's the same people, though. <laughs> but there's there's a bunch of people like that. Thank you so much, Renee. Yes, it's Renee. Invite us to the Association of the Group. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's meeting me, too. <laughs> Every time I see you in the hallway, I want to ask you questions about it. Yeah. Um, I want to hold on. Okay, because we're a little new public. Oh, yeah, she's any members that have questions. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press pound nine on your phone. Library director will display the timer on the screen. Okay, we're good. Okay. 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 Sorry. Thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so unfinished business, there's none. New business, there's none. And to the library director's report. Okay. Um, a couple of fun things on there. Just um, the the old book that was mailed to us with no note. That's right. They didn't want to be scolded, <laughs> but that was pretty interesting. Um, the year and it smelled old. I will say <laughs> when I opened the envelope. <laughs> um, um, but that and some great kudos. And then I just have some announcements. Um, the first is we have some flyers downstairs, and it's also posted on the city clerk board that um, there are openings for some of the um, boards and commissions, the like pedestrian advisory committee. Board of Library Trustees, because Nicole is, is um, turning out after December, the Downtown Committee, Human Relations Commission, Parks and Rec Commission, Performing Arts Committee, Public Safety Advisory Board, Senior Advisory Committee, and Visual Arts Committee. And there's a QR code on the, on the flyer. Um, um, applications are due November 8th. So if any of you have um, 
friends, neighbors, colleagues um, asked to announce this at, at the, that those are there. And then the Mountain View Historical Association asked me to invite the board um, to an event Sunday, November 3rd. It's a free um, event and I'll pass these flyers around. Um, they, they asked to register if you're interested in attending because they wanted me to. So I let them know we would uh, um, We have about two ballot boxes outside the library for uh, the, the um, voting envelopes, um, just so you know. And as I, um, the California state library directors forum was last week it was an all day our first in person believe it or not since pre-pandemic but all the state library directors gathered for a full day um we had a, a speaker talking about just issues in the libraries and it was a great um, day getting together with all the state um, library directors and then following that last week was the California Library Association annual conference and we were able to send three or four, three um, staff to, to that that was in Pasadena. So I talked to one today who had a great experience with programs, um, eclectic mix of programs and, and so forth. So, um, we're, we're glad we were able to send three staff to that. Um, my presentation last month, was it already September? Um, I mentioned Assembly Bill 1825 that was sitting on the governor's desk about the um, ban banning, the banning of books and the governor did sign that. So, um, it prohibits banning of books based on race, nationality, religion, gender, identity, sexual orientation, disability, social economic status, or political affiliation of a book's subject, author, or intended audience. Um, and it does protect library staff from being fired or disciplined if they are following the policy um, when making programming decisions or refusing to remove a book. So it's basically giving um, a lot of attention um, or protection, I'm sorry, um, for library staff. And just um, to note, um, there was a note that um, within California, I think it's the highest challenges, the most challenges within California came from the city of Huntington Beach and Fresno County this past year. Um, were just the, the particular areas where there were challenges mostly, but the government did sign that and it's the, called the California Freedom to Read Act. The giving protection, we want to give you that update. Um, next week already is Halloween and um, the library celebrates Halloween by giving out goodies. It's typically like pencils and things, not not candy because we, <laughs> we don't want to get into yeah. Um, so we give out um, non-food items and we'll be doing that throughout the day at all of our service desks. And then the friends um, will be doing the same in the lobby shop as um, um, in that. Candy yeah, at the little table. Three <laughs> lollipops. <laughs> um, we did, and some of the staff do dress up on Halloween. So if you're here, you may see. Um, and then um, um, we have a staff engagement committee that um, we'll have treats. We'll have treats for the staff, and we'll have um, um, candy and and fruits and things. So healthy snacks as well. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then next week. Um, there's a retired police dog that makes his rounds. Sometimes he's, um, his retirement job is he's, he's kind of a, um, therapy dog for the, the employees. So he's coming to the library for library staff for two hours next Tuesday to just cuddled and pet and loved. And I don't know if you've seen him around at some of the events at the night out, he was, there with one of the officers. And so um, we'll be here for the staff next week, which is wonderful. And then 
um, a couple updates that will be in the next update, but since we're not meeting till December, um, I was excited to share that the state library had a grant for stargazing kits um, and for all the public libraries. Of course, we asked for 20, but we, yeah, that was quite a bit. It was a huge um, surge in, um, rec in, in libraries who would want to, we got to, which I'm super thankful, but they'll include a telescope, a bench, so you can sit, and a couple guides and kits. It's a, we haven't received them yet, but we're super excited for that. And then we received a grant for um, table device chargers um, for our public tables so mm -hmm. that um, we're going to attach them wherever we can so that when you're in a meeting or in the study room, you can sit your phone down and it'll charge as you're in there. So we got that, but more information will be in the next month's report. Um, and then next week also, busy week next week, um, the State Library also offers a service for disaster preparation for historical um materials. So they're going to be in here for a full day looking at our items in the History Center. As you know, the Mount View Historical Association, we also store some of their items. So they're going to come and do an assessment, look at what we can do, how we can protect items um, um, in a flood, in a fire, all of those kinds of things, whatever we can do to protect. So we'll do, they're spending a day to look through our materials and offer that. And it was a free service. So um, we're excited to have them come and, and, and do that for us. So that's about it for additional items. A lot going on. It's a busy time, I'm sure. Very busy for sure. And I think in December we had talked about because there's a tree <laughs> ceremony. Yeah. The, the last you know, <laughs> I'm fine to meet that day. That's fine. Okay. But was there a vote on that eventually? I was out of town for the last meeting, so I'm just not sure. I think we decided to keep it okay. on that day. That's okay. December 9th. Um, okay. The tree lighting's at 5.30. It does end at 7, and then we start right at 7. Parking could be a little, so. Shelter. Yeah. Yeah. So if you come early, um, Renee was going to do her presentation then, but she's participating in the tree lighting. We do a, a story time and, um, and all that, so she'll be busy with that so we had her come come tonight instead but yeah it'd be a festive night that night for sure you guys a beloved name in the newsletter um in terms of miss alex I mean, alex yes yes so to extend a warm to welcome or oh, yes yes she'll be back on monday so she's starting back here today so excited to have her is there a lot of people that missed her story times and so. I'm sure they'll be thrilled with her next story. I don't know when, when she'll if she'll jump right in and do one of the next story times, but I'm sure the kids and and parents and all, everyone will be thrilled to see her again. So I also wondered, um, are the book uh, are the book will be all to in the Report or we calculate them because they are something that we uh, have to give to the. In fact, our analyst right now is finishing up the the fiscal year all the um, statistics to give submit to the state library. So we do have the numbers, and we can either maybe show them quarterly or at every. Like the monthly pro like number of stops, programs, people, we can include that in the directory to the viewers. Yeah. Okay. Chrissy, if you if you wanted to increase um telescope availability, I know that Sunville has at least one and possibly three scopes these days. They bought one for the just for the solar eclipse, and they were talking about a couple of optical telescopes as well. And we could do like a joint Mountain View Sunnyvale and then Sunnyvale Mountain View. A program or yeah. oh related. Yeah. Just, yeah. Well we talked about, I don't know, I know we've had we want to do programs related. Just had the I attended part of the NASA. We had a NASA scientist talking about Mars. Yeah. 
within. Yeah. He went to grad school with him. He was a kid. Yes. I <laughs> sat there some of the <laughs> He was great because when I walked in, some of it was very technical. And there were a lot of kids in there. And some of the kids were very focused. Some was over my head, but he really did a good job in talking in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, am I going to walk in there and just be? But he was really, yeah, he was really good. It was a good, but we lo love to do more programs related. And I think, I don't know if there was one recently or upcoming, but yeah. If any contacts, let us know. Because, uh, I have a lot of people in various yeah. places. Not Kyle's our programming, you know Kyle, yeah. so yeah. Let Kyle know. Perfect. Yeah. Love doing programs too. Um, stuff. We have to figure out where we're in a store. I don't know how big it is because <laughs> our we keep stuff in our back work room. So it's yeah, how big are they? And how to store it because we have the backpacks for that we are giving out part of the that we got with the California State Park passes. We have those hanging on the walls. So like. I think the telescopes are going to be a little bigger. How <laughs> how, yeah. how would you? Yeah, I'm it. kind of glad we didn't get 20 because I don't know where we would have kept 20. But yeah, if it and then if it turns out um, they're checked out all the time, we'll ask Marika and the friends for, you know, funds for purchasing more. So that's what's great with with um, the friends is some of these things that we might get um, that, that they they um, love to fund things like Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, put, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press pound nine on your phone. Library director will display the timer on the screen. So in December, um, I'm putting together a draft. Do you all adopt the calendar, the meeting calendar for 2025? So everything else is done on fiscal year except for the meeting dates, um, um, which are typically the you know the third Wednesday, but with some holidays and putting together a draft. Um, so all of the boards and commissions before the start of the calendar year need to improve their regular meetings. And then obviously sometimes through the year we have a cancellation or a special meeting. So I'll have that draft for you um, at the December meeting um, with the dates. And then um, just a report, we'll try to include some of the things that we'll be asking for in the budget because our stuff is due December around the 10th for what we for next fiscal year. So we're already um, have been talking to staff about about that. So we'll try to include either my verbal update or on the report some of the things will be being in the budget of request. So those are the two we were gonna have, like I mentioned, Renee at December. That's why we had two presentations tonight. So she's participating in the Tree lighting, so she couldn't make it then. And so, so thanks for December. Uh, would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button on Zoom or press pound nine on the phone. Library director will display the timer on the screen. And the meeting is adjourned at 8.18 p.m. And the next library board meeting will be held on Monday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Should I do this? Yes. yes. <laughs>